following presentation has been closed captioned. Wait a minute, aren't you... Uh... Oh, no, 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 everyone makes that mistake. You think I'm Percival Stunk. I'm his brother, Ithic. Then you're not Jerry Lewis? Jerry who? He was alone up there on the big screen because in many ways his new career was just beginning. For the first time since his success with Martin and Lewis, Jerry was flying solo. I can scare a little too. Ha -ha! Yeah! Oh! He would soon go from zany comic to total filmmaker who would write, produce, and direct some of the funniest movies of our times. He would greatly influence the movie-making process and be hailed as a filmmaking genius. Not bad for a kid from New Jersey who started at 19 as part of a team named Martin and Lewis. to Martin and Lewis, their golden age of comedy. Part five, Jerry Lewis, Total Filmmaker. Starring Jerry Lewis, with a special appearance by director John Landis. Plus, outtakes, gag reels, Jerry Lewis films never before seen by the public. And Jerry Lewis himself, as he takes us to Paramount Pictures, his motion picture home of 17 years. Here we are, Paramount Studios. And we're here at the administration building. This is the Jerry Lewis building on the Paramount lot, I'll have you know. It used to be like a dirty secret. You know, it used to be, you like Jerry Lewis? Yeah. <laughs> you know. For 10 years, Jerry was part of the team of Martin and Lewis. Together, they made 16 films at Paramount. I love you and kiss you. Love you and kiss you. Ah. Love you and kiss you. But did she get paid? But by the summer of 1956, they had broken up and gone their separate ways. Let's separate. It's a change when you're, when you're married for 10 years and you have a relationship that was as meaningful as what Dean and I had. It was very strange, yet it was a wonderful experience because you had a chance to break out. He had a chance to do things that he wanted to do all through our 10 years together. I had things I wanted to do and we were able to spread our wings a little bit. And spread them they did. Jerry focused on his movie career, but now, on his own, he had to reinvent the comedy genius that had been Martin and Lewis. Excuse me. He did it by introducing the audience to a new Jerry, no longer dependent on the older, wiser Dean to bail him out of trouble. I knew that I needed to get the audience's attention. The delivery of a comic is vital. How do you deliver the comedian? You don't just find him sitting at a bar. You don't see him on a street corner. You build to that introduction of the comic. All right, now relax. The character he introduced no longer had Dean, and that meant abandoning the buddy formula that had been part of the Martin and Lewis success. Well, well don't much. get mad, because I was just going to say that I, I'm nervous. I didn't mean... Well, you see, what I meant to say was that because it is... Wipe it off. Wipe it off. Yes. Well, I'm awfully sorry, sir, but I'm nervous. It's a little will help it, I think. Wipe it off. Yes, sir. I'm awfully sorry about... And that meant coming up with his own yeah, solutions. He did that for his character, and he did that for his career, by becoming the producer of his own films. The producership in our business is a vital role. It's a heavy responsibility. You're responsible for the money. You're responsible for the casting, sets, wardrobe, preparation, building the project, making sure that when you say the script is where it should be and you go forward, that has to come from somebody. This increased control made sure that Jerry could shape yeah. and maintain his characters just the way he wanted them to be. Please, I'm, I'm too tall to die. <laughs> Audiences still saw Jerry as a bungler, fighting Herculean battles for simple survival. But those in the picture business began to force in the industry. Get up, meathead! Oh. Get up! 
I'll not fall down. I watch the television. The television is broken, Papa. Television is not broke. Look. Howdy out there, neighbors. I know you can look in on television every day and buy everything for your home. That's awful. Keep going. Superbo. <laughs> Uncle Rowell, coming to you once again with storybook time. On screen, Jerry caused all sorts of chaos. But what set his characters apart was that their disasters always led to something good. Oh, well, you don't understand, Miss Livingston. You see, all I wanted to do was apologize to you. See? Will you get out of here if you no, don't? Yes. Right. Oh, wait, my foot. Ah! Wait, my foot. My foot is stuck. Wait, get out of here, wait, my friend. All right. Here, my arm. Wait. Audiences didn't realize how active Jerry was in the process of making his own movies. And he did it because movie making was something that he loved. I loved doing at the studio what I did. I was in every department. I was in everybody's hair, but I had to learn. I spent so much time in the camera department, the miniature department, wardrobe, makeup, sets, art direction, name it. I had to learn everything. And I was having a marvelous time learning about the film business and learning my craft. It was an amazing contrast. Jerry Lewis, the producer who had real expertise, and Jerry Lewis, the character who turned the world into chaos. easy to identify with his tragedies and misfortunes. Perhaps that's why audiences loved him. The well-meaning fumbler. This became his comic philosophy as a character. To create the comedic atmosphere on screen, Jerry also tried to maintain a loose and fun attitude off screen. Even a simple task like walking through a door, as in these outtakes, provided a forum for Jerry's storehouse of laughs. Jerry. Yes, he's here. Good for you, Frank. <laughs> Jerry. Yeah? <laughs> I've got gag reels of every film I ever made. Some are wonderful, some are terrible, but mostly it's to entertain the crew. Yes? <laughs> Eight, ten weeks of filming went by before you knew it, because we had so much fun. 
Yes. <laughs> blindfold, at least. Aim. Jerry wasn't the only one having fun on the set. This is a scene from The Patsy. Fire! But this is how film great Ready? Peter Lorre carried on in outtakes. Aim. Fire. <laughs> Aim. Fire! <laughs> Jerry Lewis inspired, I think, all the comics of the contemporary comics. I mean, I remember um, I made a movie called Three Amigos, and there was a scene with Steve Martin and Chevy, Short, Chevy Chase and Marty Short, and they had to react to this gunfire, and they all did. It was very funny, and I laughed, and I, um, and they were just doing Jerry Lewis, you know? The success of Jerry's movies led Paramount to offer him the highest contract at that time. Paramount Studios announces an unprecedented $10 million pact with Jerry Lewis. Such excitement over a piece of paper has not been experienced by the world since the League of Nations covenant was rejected by the Congress of the United States of America. And Jerry responded with a string of successful features that cemented his relationship with Paramount and gave him stature as an internationally acclaimed filmmaker. I lived 17 years on the Paramount lot. I stayed here many a night working in the editing room. I stayed here many night writing. I lived here more than I did in my own house. Now that Paramount was truly his home, a big change started to happen. Hey, mister, you got that all wrong. How? You, you forgot the most important letter, the F. Audiences saw a whole new side to Jerry's talent. Borrowing from Cinderella, Jerry plays a bumbler who gets to turn into a handsome prince. In Cinderella, he makes an entrance to the ball as the prince now. So how do you make an entrance? Well, he makes an entrance that goes on. It is so silly, it would be wonderfully silly, because the staircase isn't 10 steps. It must be, it goes on forever. <laughs> to dance watching the great dancers throughout the years that I was in Broadway. That entrance in Cinderella at the ball down those steps was a take one and it was an improvised dance on my part. The music of course was prepared well in advance and I had enough time to work on it in my mind but that was the first time anyone ever saw me do it. One of the things I've always loved about his dancing, when people say it's that spastic kind of jerkiness, it is so wonderfully, uniquely Jerry Lewis. Uh, excuse me. Uh, our dance, Your Highness. We did a dry run through or a dry rehearsal. So I let my technicians know where I was going, but we covered it perfectly with two cameras and we did take one and that was it. I'll never forget you. Come back. Oh, please. Come it was a good back. thing that was it because when I ran up the stairs, I did it in 6.2 seconds. And when I got to the top, I collapsed, and I wound up in the hospital that night. Jerry suffered no permanent injury, and the film became a box office hit at Christmas.
But Paramount said they needed this film for summer. Jerry said no, Christmas. And this conflict would complete Jerry's major career change. Paramount decided to release it in the summer of 60. And I said this film was made and conceived as a Christmas picture for families. It is a, it is a Christmas package. Well, this was mid-January. And I said, if I give you a film for summer, will you push Cinderella to Christmas? He said, what do you mean, give us a film? It's January 18th or something like that. I said, I'll give you a film. Nobody at Paramount believed Jerry could deliver a film that quickly, since there were only five months until summer. So Jerry raised his own money, and he took on the role of producer, with which he was comfortable. Uh, excuse me. First, of course, I'd like to have you meet the writer. And, of course, without the writer, there would be an overabundance of paper. <laughs> he would also write this picture. A writer. A man we all respect probably more than anyone else in the picture business. And this is our writer. D.T. Stronghold. Hello, 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 Mr. Bird. I, I love you, great producer. And in addition, he would make his debut as a director. Yes, the mighty director. Shh, Schwein, can't you see I'm crazy? Oh, it's you, Mr. Bird. It's a pleasure to have you on the set. Oh, I broke both my Ah, oh, there are all the... Of course, he would also star in it. But here, here is our star, the man who will deliver us from TV. Writer, producer, again, director, star. No one in Hollywood today has ever taken on that many roles. Go ahead, Jerry. Show us some of the funny things that uh, we've been talking about that are in this picture. Go ahead, Jerry. Some of them kind of stiffen up a little when you ask them to ad lib. <laughs> Indeed, Jerry delivered on his promise. The result is now considered a comedy masterpiece. How are you? Here you are, Stanley. Get everything out of the trunk. went to Florida to open at the Fountain Blue, and I wrote a screenplay in eight days. It later became known as the Bellboy. I used the Fountain Blue facilities. I started shooting the Bellboy on February the 2nd. I finished shooting it February 26th. I opened in Las Vegas on February 28th. I was cutting the Bellboy backstage at the Sands Hotel. We gave Paramount a summer release, and the rest there is history. The premise of the bellboy was exceedingly simple, a year in the life of the bumbling bellboy Stanley. But the uniqueness was that Jerry's part was played entirely in pantomime. debut was a personal and critical success, and the film opened to tremendous business. Based on this success, Jerry decided to again wear four hats as writer, producer, director, and star of his next feature. In the film, Jerry plays the only man in a boarding house of women. That man 
man who's your date who's taking you out. Thank you very much, Herbert. Tell him I'll be right down. Well, where's my girl? Oh, well, I just wanted to tell Wait you... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold it. I don't believe my hat. Do you know that's my brand new hat? Do you know that you better get up and give me my hat? Maybe we could get it weaved. Fix the hat. Put it on my head. I don't like it that way. Is that all right? No. Would you like it that way? No, I think it would be good. Like that? And one of the things I always liked as Jerry Lewis as a filmmaker was his dedication to a gag. I mean, once he got a conception and he would do some very elaborate gag, he would just do it. And it would sometimes just go on forever. I don't like it that way. Oh, my hair. Comb my hair. That's better. lining it goes on and on and on he takes a, a a line of a gag until it becomes science fiction you know sometimes it gets so out there um and so abstract and conceptual that it's just very very funny that's better thank you there's just can i get that strand hanging please do my eyebrow. No. What happened to my head? Darling, I see you've met Herbie. Yeah. Yeah, I met Herbie. A funny movie, yes, but one of the truly amazing things was the set. Jerry conceived and constructed the largest indoor set ever built at Paramount Studios. We're sitting outside of what were stages 15 and 16, and it took the two stages to build the ladies' man set. We needed two stages because the ladies' man set was um, 60 rooms, and I used um, 35 women in the ladies' man. On stage 15, I had 35 dressing rooms, one for every performer. I had makeup and wardrobe and everything was here. Every film Jerry produced made people laugh, and he became one of the world's most well-known and popular stars. Get up there right away and 
finish that aerial. Sandy, turn off the hose! <laughs> Mr. Bryant, a real nice chair for you to relax. And after you sit nice in the sun, we'll get lotion so you don't burn. You'll see this chair we we get it open for you, and you finally can sit, Mr. Bryant. growing he was i knew they had an operation and they took out but i didn't think that mu- mr brian the new secretary well, really mr belt well no i was the only and i suppose that's because i'll be too busy with your children well Is that it no i ain't got none i mean but if you'd like to gather a few together do, do, do you want to put a few together it would be a good no i'd love to stanley and i love you well that's okay i mean you're right uh, that is your win because I love you too, but I should be the aggressor. You shouldn't be uh, chasing me. Aren't you overacting a little bit, Miss Baldwin? Down, down. It's a movie. See, I'm fine. The people in the theater know I ain't gonna die. Here, it's a movie stay. Here, look at it, see? There's wires and lights, and I'm gonna make more movies, so I couldn't die. It's like a make-believe, it's a dumb city. Mr. Lewis, you are a complete nut. Which reminds me, I'm having nuts and whipped cream for lunch. Would you join me, please? Crew, that's lunch, one hour for the actors and seven days for the technicians. It's a movie set, breaking once and for all. He really was out there. Where you pull back and you pull back and you, you pull back off the set. I mean, you're on the stage. As a filmmaker, he consistently did interesting things. And as a filmmaker, he wrote, produced, directed, and starred, which carried with it tremendous pressure. And Jerry knew it was more important than ever to keep a sense of fun on the set. And if you ever found Jerry's character behind a door, watch out. Because he can stay there for four or five days just coming in and out, opening the door with something else, whether it's a prop on his head, blacked out teeth, cigarette smoke. He'd come in with something. Hold it. It was just great fun. You can do gag reels on anything you do. Just a minute. Important business first. This is important. <laughs> Here's a look at what really went on in the making of a Jerry Lewis film. 363-3. Where are you going? You aren't leaving, are you, Herbie? I am too. I don't mind cleaning and washing and arithmetic. <laughs> You aren't leaving, are you, Herbie? I certainly am, and why shouldn't I stay here? <laughs> you aren't leaving, are you, Herbie? Now, if I don't say nothing, I won't blow it. <laughs> Go, Don. 
Even in outtakes, his timing was sharp. And the more susceptible his cast and crew, the more Jerry would create situations that he could use to get laughs. I love you, I love you. I have dander for four years now. <laughs> Hi there. I've been wearing jockey shorts on my head, I believe. <laughs> One picture of the family, hold it. Yogi Berra. Jerry had received a lot of training on how to make movies and keeping it fun more than a decade before. He made home movies, but not just any home movies. Jerry had been directing elaborate feature-length spoofs for years. Hello, operator. Will you please give me 2465 3392467 and I made some home movies with Janet Lee, Tony Curtis, Mona Freeman, Shelley Winters, John Barrymore Jr. What I thought was great fun and a hobby, it became an education. We're talking about 48, 49, 50, 51. I never directed till 1960, but in that interim period, I never stopped learning. Who am I? Never mind who I am. Just listen. You know Yasso Farkowitz, don't you? Well, Yasso Farkowitz. The films were all takeoffs on the current hits of the time. Sunset Boulevard became Fairfax Avenue. Becky, I'm leaving. Goodbye, shoot on Saturday. I'd pay the lab extra to give me a print on Sunday. We'd then go into the cutting room and we'd cut together what we shot. And we had the best time. I mean, the Saturdays and Sundays at my house, there was never under 60, 70 people. My doctor was my sound man. My manager was my prop and production coordinator. My children were gaffers and runners and electricians. These films all had dialogue, special effects, and music. And the takeoffs continued. The hit film, Come Back Little Sheba, became Come Back Little Shiksa. Bogart hit the enforcer in Marmot. And I proceeded to buy additional equipment. And before you knew it, I had a home studio. I built a playhouse behind my house that sat 300 people with folding chairs. I had a screen, projection room, cutting room, lab. I did it all at home every weekend. I would go to the main title department. Here at the studio, they would print up my main titles for me to shoot at home on Saturday. I love Chris and the mums, Chris and the mums, make me scream with delight. Name it. I had to learn everything. And I was having a marvelous time learning about the film business. The 
Home filmmaking started off simple at first, but Jerry was learning, staging, camera position, lighting, skills that one day would propel him to stardom as both an actor and a director. And along the way, everyone involved was having a blast. So much so that they even staged their own premieres. Producers and stars from all the Hollywood studios attended, even America's future president. Well... You talk, honey. No, Nancy, what did you think of the picture? Well, I thought it was just wonderful, but you tell them, honey. Oh, well, I thought it was wonderful, too. You know, when you struggled all your life with those quickies and those stinkers like uh, King's Row and things like that, you dream of getting in a picture like this. <laughs> Maybe someday it'll happen to us. Yeah, yeah, we'll just wait. <laughs> but the training made him ready to take on all four tasks at Paramount. Writing, producing, directing, and starring. He was the Paramount top moneymaker, and more popular than even top movie stars like Rock Hudson or James Stewart. This made him comfortable enough to make a parody of working as an errand boy at a movie studio. Like I used the fountain blue for the bellboy, I used Paramount for the errand boy. It's that simple. I knew what I had here and I wrote according to what I had. I used the hospital in the drowning sequence because it was there on the lot. So you write the scene to accommodate what you've got. No matter what the situation, what continued to define Jerry's characters was the never-ending battle to overcome life's minor obstacles. That this might very possibly work better than it did originally. Are you sure it will operate now? Oh, well, I've never lost a patient yet. You just stand right by and watch this, and if it doesn't work, I'll be a monkey's uncle. <laughs> You get a much stronger sucking suction now. Oh, 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 my pearls. Oh, oh, my bracelet. Oh, oh, turn it off, no. turn it off. What, what's wrong? Isn't it gonna work, ma'am? That, uh, turn it off. Turn maybe it I off. can grant her. Turn it off. The switch doesn't work.
Because Jerry's comic tragic characters touched millions of moviegoers, Edward R. Murrow television asked him to appear on his hit television show, Person to Person. Jerry, uh, from time to time, I seem to notice a rather serious streak beneath your clowning. Have you ever given any thought to producing serious movies? Uh, no, I'm afraid not, Ed. I, uh, I think that we have very qualified producers in Hollywood. We have magnificent producers, for that matter, that make great motion pictures seriously. I think that I'd like to continue making them with fun and laughter if I can, whether it's with me or other people. As a producer or as a performer, I'd like to keep people laughing if I can. Indeed, Jerry continued to make audiences laugh, but he did it in a way that unmasked the hidden sides to all of us. In 1963, Jerry directed his fourth studio picture. Drawing on his own hidden side, Jerry redid the Jekyll and Hyde story, telling of a meek college professor who thinks he wants strength and self-confidence. I was always trying to better the Jekyll and Hyde idea, and I took that and put it on the screen. Every director has a dream in his life, and that is to make the ultimate marvelous film or the perfect work. Well, it's an imperfect film, but for this director, it's the best work I've done. The man normally so funny, Jerry took a major character risk with this film, permitting the audience to experience another side of Jerry Lewis. What'll it be? Ah, oh, that's no way to talk. What'll it be? That's no way to treat a customer. Come here, try it like this. Pay attention, you'll feel better and the customers will be happier. Try this. What'll it be? Mm, try that. Come on, we haven't got all night. Try it. There's a scene in The Nutty Professor, and he's What'll with a uh, bartender. And it's extraordinary. It's absolutely amazing for a comic, a filmmaker, to allow himself to be that horrific. I mean, it is a wonderful scene. It is so brutal and funny and very funny but funny in a dangerous way. It's dangerous comedy. You know, dangerous comedy is the stuff that, uh, you know, Saturday Night Live and uh, was given credit for. But he, Jerry was out there. He was doing dangerous stuff. Good, that was wonderful. Did anyone ever tell you you couldn't sing? Nice. We Make see that guy all over better. the world. He'll pop up in some city, some bar, some restaurant, and I wrote him to be this ugly person. Why don't you pick on somebody your own disposition? Oh, please, Mr. Barroom Brawler. Don't hurt me or anything like that. <laughs> Coming from the director's point of view, I thought this was the ugliest, most nauseating character. So much so that I had my production department push shooting that character to the end of the picture. I loved playing the Nutty Professor. Yes, he was good. I like, yes, he was fun. I used too much. The film cleverly explored the hidden wants and needs of all of us. But it was also filled with wonderful sight gags as the Nutty Professor tries to cope with everyday life. That's the way it was in the movie, but here are some of the nutty things that didn't make it into the final cut. When you're looking at the totality of the film and you have so much time, some things you shoot, some things you believe in get in the way. I wonder what will happen. If it works, that is. And the sequence to show his transformation and the distortion, I had written what I thought was a marvelous scene. It didn't belong. I pulled it out after I shot it. 
The Nutty Professor not only was Jerry's most satisfying picture as a filmmaker, but it was a critical and financial success as well. His reputation as an all-around filmmaker was spreading from Hollywood to Japan to Europe. I'm doing the international language. Everything I do is visual. Everything I do is broad, easy to understand. It's only visual and sight. And that can play anywhere in the world. There's nothing you need to have interpreted for you. The visual is basic. The sounds are cute and understandable in that there's nothing there to understand. a door in the room that bangs into your face. You don't need an interpreter for that. And that's what I did. And the foreign audiences were thrilled with the fact that they didn't have to think about anything but to sit there and watch. And they understood what I did. Audiences around the world love Jerry Lewis movies because he made them laugh no matter what their native language. As a result, he received Best Director Awards in eight separate countries. Because he directed, wrote, produced, and starred all in the same film, in Italy, Germany, Spain, the Netherlands, Japan, and France, they began to see in him more than just being a funny clown. Indeed, Jerry was much, much more. In fact, he even changed the way films were made. In uh, November 1956, I built from a sketch that I designed the video assist that is now used in motion pictures. And people really get a big kick out of when you hear someone on the technical side of the, the camera say, you know, Jerry Lewis invented that. And they'll look at it, what? As a technical innovation for the time, he mounted a small video camera directly next to the 35 millimeter lens. So I would have 15 monitors all over the set to use at my discretion as the director and the actor. It was the only way I could do both jobs. When videotape finally became accessible, Jerry added it to his video assist, another technical innovation. In 1966, Jerry was honored for creating Video Assist. Today, almost every film, television show, and commercial is shot with Jerry's invention. But all this technical brilliance was behind the scenes. In front of the camera, Jerry was still playing ordinary guys fighting uphill battles for daily survival. In one of Jerry's funniest sequences, in The Patsy, Jerry plays a young man sent to a music teacher for a singing lesson. I, I caught it, and it almost... Mr. Ferguson's instructions to me were to teach you to sing. Ah, uh, listen. Try this. Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, oh! film as director and the 30th film he made for Paramount. The next year, Jerry would again wear four hats for the family jewels, writing, producing, directing, and starring. And he also plays seven different characters within the movie. But Family Jewels would be the last film Jerry would direct at Paramount. I particularly knew that there was, there were great avenues out there other studios, other offers, other scripts, and so on. And so we went out and uh, did our thing. We left Paramount, I went on to Columbia, and uh, proceeded to do films there. But you gotta keep going, you gotta keep moving in this business, you know. 17 years at Paramount, 33 movies, nearly a billion dollars. But like the split up between Martin and Lewis, this was not a time of mourning, but a new beginning. Jerry would go on to make films at other studios. He would write a textbook on making films, and he would begin teaching others the art of filmmaking. Any questions? 
But Jerry's biggest surprise came in 1977 when he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for bringing 40 years of laughter to the world. Spearheaded by Senator Les Aspen, it involved thousands of letters being written to Nobel Prize headquarters nominating Jerry. Reuters calls me from London. Mr. Lewis, yes. Uh, this is Ed Fernand, Reuters, London. We wanted to know what your feelings are about the, the Nobel Peace Prize nomination. I said, I think it's a wonderful process. I think it's great that people are nominated. I don't know what's happening here. And I gave him some kind of a, uh, a gag-like answer. He said, no, 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 no. I'm in reference to your nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize. And I was stunned. I didn't know what to do about it. Then I felt I was that far off the ground for about seven years after that. I was at the first comic relief up here at the amphitheater. And I remember Jerry Lewis coming out. And there was every great contemporary comic there, and he was the one who got the standing ovation. Jerry Lewis was a skinny 21-year-old when he got to Paramount. But when he left, he was the most successful single piece of talent Paramount had then produced. But he hadn't done it alone. It took the incredible talent of Dean Martin to make it happen. Because without those 10 years with Martin and Lewis, there wouldn't have been a comedy act, nightclubs, or a Paramount contract. For 10 years, as part of Martin and Lewis, he made America double up in stitches. And for the nearly 40 years since, he has indeed risen to become the total filmmaker. Wait till you laugh. 